Tribalism is defined as the behavior and attitudes that stem from strong loyalty to one's own tribe or social group. It has been a prevalent social construct since the beginning of times, as evidenced by man's early will to identify leaders and follow such leaders through thick and thin, putting their own beliefs and personal gains to the side to remain loyal to the tribe. As society grew and evolved, so did this construct of tribalism. Soon, tribal leaders leading groups of 10 to 20 became monarchs and presidents leading thousands, and the same tribalistic loyalty followed. Either you were with the king, or you were against the king, with no middle ground for discourse. Fast forward a few centuries, and mankind has yet to evolve from their primitive tribalistic instincts. It's ever present in our political discourse, and it especially extends to the world of sports. In this documentary, I want to explore why that is. Why do fans remain loyal to teams whom over and over again show zero loyalty in return? Why do we consistently root for teams who deliver us nothing but heartbreak and agony, yet come back every year hoping for change? As a lifelong agonizing Knicks fan myself, I hope an exploration into my favorite basketball franchise might help answer that question. For those born too late to take part in the glory days of New York basketball, like when Willis Reed, Earl the Pearl Monroe, and Walt Clyde Frazier brought New York its first and only two championships, or when Pat Riley and Patrick Ewing's grit and grind Knicks teams bullied opposition for the better part of a decade, it may be hard to imagine how a team could so perfectly encapsulate an entire city's hustle and culture. New Yorkers identified with their Knicks and took great pride in that identity. However, in recent years that pride has greatly diminished. With just four playoff bursts since 2001, after a streak of 14 straight seasons making the playoffs from 1987 to 2000, the winning culture that was once synonymous with Knicks basketball is now a culture personified by losing and organizational dysfunction. But why? What so drastically shifted in this time period, leaving a once proud franchise in disarray? And more importantly, why do fans still show up every night supporting the team? People can argue a multitude of decisions and factors led to the dysfunctional state of the present-day Knicks. However, I'd argue you can pinpoint this downfall of a once-proud franchise to a single day. A moment in time that would forever change New York basketball. May 14, 1999. The day James Dolan took over as acting chairman of Madison Square Garden operations, which included full control over the Knicks and Rangers sports franchises. When former chairman Mark Lusgarden Face of the Knicks' ownership during the glory years of the 1990s passed from an unfortunate and untimely death due to pancreatic cancer, Dolan, with little management experience, was left running the most valuable sports franchise in the world. Quickly, this lack of experience started impacting the Knicks in a negative way. On September 20, 2000, Knicks fans got their first glimpse at the dysfunction that would hinder their franchise in the coming years when they traded away franchise icon Patrick Ewing for a 33-year-old Glenn Rice. A slap in the face to the success, loyalty, and culture Ewing helped build on and off the court, this trade was the first of many under Dolan's tenure that left fans angry and confused. However, it was the signing made in December of 2003 that would lead to the most embarrassing five-year stretch in franchise history. On the heels of missing the playoffs for two consecutive seasons, Dolan announced a change, hiring former Detroit Piston Hall of Fame point guard Isaiah Thomas as the head of basketball operations. However, running a team from the front office is a lot different than running a team on the court, and quite quickly Thomas appeared overmatched. Thomas's five-year run as GM featured a laundry list of some of the most mind-boggling and head-scratching transactions in recent basketball memory, the likes of which include sending two first-round picks for an overpaid Stefan Marbury and an old Penny Hardaway, and then a year later trading an additional two first-round picks for the overweight Eddie Curry leaving the franchise crippled with overbloated contracts and no draft compensation to rebuild. To add insult to injury, three of those four first-round picks would go on to become all-star players and top 10 lottery selections in Gordon Hayward, LaMarcus Aldridge, and Joe Kim Noah. In addition to destroying the roster, Thomas's first three seasons saw three head coaches come and go, with instability and chaos becoming a theme of his tenure. So logically, of course, rather than firing Thomas, Dolan promoted him. Heading into the 2006 season, in another shocking move, Thomas declared he himself would begin coaching the team in addition to his president of basketball operations responsibilities. Rather than looking at this as an opportunity to seize control over his team, Dolan sat back as Thomas slowly destroyed any ounce of credibility the once proud franchise had. 
NBA Commissioner David Stern would even take note of the situation, stating, quote, they're not a model of intelligent management. However, the Thomas tenure under Dolan hit an all-time low in October of 2007 when a former Knicks executive, Anuka Brown Sanders, filed a sexual harassment lawsuit against Thomas and Madison Square Garden. The ensuing legal battle revealed ugly details that Thomas made several unwanted sexual advances towards Brown, and when Brown went on to complain of these advances, Dolan ultimately fired her. The jury found Thomas and Dolan guilty, awarding $11.6 million to Brown. Despite the ruling, neither Thomas nor Dolan would go on to show any remorse about the situation, claiming innocence even through the guilty verdict. I want to say it as loud as I possibly can. I am innocent, I'm very innocent, and I did not do the things that she accused me in this courtroom of doing. The Thomas tenure would thankfully come to an end on April 2, 2008, when former Indiana Pacer president Donnie Walsh was hired to take over Thomas's position as president of basketball operations. Thomas led the Knicks to a paltry 151 and 259 record over his five seasons running the team. Under Donnie Walsh, the Knicks began to show signs of life. With a clear vision of a youthful rebuild, the Knicks began reaccumulating assets thrown away during the Thomas regime. However, this process was quickly undermined in August of 2010 when the Knicks attempted to rehire Isaiah Thomas as a consultant on the orders of owner James Dolan. This move angered Walsh, who would resign from the team the following season. In the middle of the 2010 season, amidst pressure from Dolan, the Knicks would trade for all-star Carmelo Anthony. While a great move on a surface level, many analysts would question the timing of this move, with heavy rumors swirling that Anthony intended on signing with the Knicks in free agency that summer. This trade would see the Knicks give away four starters and two future first-round picks, once again leaving them with a barren asset pool. While Anthony would provide exciting moments for Knicks basketball in the coming years, the trade would ultimately hinder their championship ceiling in a short-sighted attempt at relevancy instead of waiting two more months to get Anthony in free agency at no additional cost. Through the first 10 years of Dolan's ownership, a pattern of short-sighted decision-making is increasingly becoming prevalent and would continue in the coming years. 2012 and 2013 would feature two of the most exciting seasons in recent Nick memory, the lone bright spots amidst two plus decades of darkness. 2012 saw Jeremy Lin produce his infamous Lin Sanity run, electrifying the sports world and New York with breathtaking moments night after night, while 2013 saw the Knicks win 54 games along with the number two seed in the Eastern Conference. However, instability still rattled the franchise, with coach Mike D'Antoni resigning in the middle of the 2012 season, citing differences with management followed by ownership refusing to match the Houston Rockets offer sheet for Lynn at the end of the 2012 season, citing financial reasons in basketball's largest market. 2013 would end in disappointment, with the Knicks falling to a lower-ranked Pacer team in the second round, and although fans didn't know it at the time, those brief two seasons would be a modern Knicks fan's glory years. After a series of questionable roster decisions, including trading another future first-round pick for Andrea Bargnani, the Knicks would miss the playoffs the following season, winning just 37 games, resulting in coach Mike Woodson's firing just a year removed from finishing third in Coach of the Year voting. Dolan's lack of patience was once again hindering the franchise. His answer. In May of 2014, Dolan hired Phil Jackson as head of basketball operations along with head coach Derek Fisher. A move eerily similar to the hiring of Isaiah Thomas Dolan opted for inexperienced, flashy names, using band-aids to try and patch a leak. The Phil Jackson era would prove nearly as disastrous as the Isaiah Thomas one, with a laundry list of head-scratching decisions that would continue to cement the Knicks as a league-wide laughingstock. This included giving Joe Kim Noah $72 million in his age 31 season. Amid scandals surrounding head coach Derek Fisher off the court, James Dolan once again found himself firing his head coach after two seasons, something of a Nick tradition at this point. In 2017, Dolan once again found himself the center of controversy for all of the wrong reasons, when Knicks legend Charles Oakley was forcibly removed from courtside at Madison Square Garden during a nationally televised game against the Clippers. Oakley was later handcuffed, arrested, and charged with multiple accounts. 
A media firestorm ensued over the rift between owner James Dolan and Oakley, even prompting Commissioner Adam Silver to get involved along with Michael Jordan. With Oakley being a symbol of Nick pride and loyalty, the entire situation was a national embarrassment for the organization. In February of 2019, All-Star Kristaps Porzingis demanded a trade after being worn down by the losing culture in just three seasons with the team. This organizational incompetence has continued year after year, with the Knicks failing to reach even 30 wins since 2016, leaving us in present day with a new Knicks regime headed by President of Basketball Operations Leon Rose promising change to a burnt-out fan base. But with James Dolan still entrenched as the owner, Is there any reason to believe Rose will be empowered enough to force change over a sustained period of time, despite the promising early results? And more importantly, does it matter? Will fans continue to support the Knicks year after year, despite the on-court and off-court embarrassments they've provided? I talked with a couple of basketball fans to get their opinions. Uh, How long have you been a Knicks fan? Um, I could probably trace my Knicks fandom as far back as my basketball fandom, which is like around 06-ish. Probably since I've ever lived in New York, so like 20 years. Um, the first, I'd say probably since Mello got traded. Like once okay. Mello came to the Knicks was like once I became like interested in them. We'll start with owner James Dolan. So what are your general thoughts on on Dolan? All right, I can summarize it very generally in the great words of Max Kellerman. James Dolan was born on third base and thought he had a triple. He is the living embodiment of privilege and just lack of awareness and lack of ownership from a from a perspective of, I don't know, he's too prideful to see the obvious. And because of that, it's an impediment on one of the the great sports outlets, one of the great sports markets in, in all of America. When you look at Philly sports and you look at them talk about the Eagles, the Sixers, the Flyers, they, when, when their GMs get interviewed, they go, well, we're doing this for the city. And that's not just Philly, but Philly, um, Boston, all of Boston, they care about the city. And when it comes to New York, all of a sudden it's about the business. And I think it is a big part of fandom and it does affect fandom because when your fandom expects it to be run like a business more than a sport, Yes, it is a business, and without the business, there is no sport. But at the same time, without people buying tickets and buying jerseys and watching on TV, you don't have your business. So I think think it's a give and take, but I think New York's give is a lot different than its take. I I mean, just like time and again, the people that he's put in in charge of the culture of Knicks basketball, it's it's been dubious choice after dubious choice. Uh, He just doesn't really make the right decisions for the franchise as a whole. And over the past couple of years, he's just been making poor decision after poor decision. And so, yeah, it's really hard for me to say after watching these two absolute implosions over the course of the last 12 or so years, that he's not the sole or at least the main source responsible for the Knicks dysfunction. And by proxy, my my disenfranchisement as a fan it's frustrating i mean i can certainly tell you i haven't been to a knicks game in a number of years um (laughs) it's not so much the losing season that turns me off as a fan as much as it's like turning me off You, you start to lose hope after a while um, but the Knicks in general, as a Knicks fan and as someone that's known how the Knicks operate for so long, like, you know, as soon as someone gets good, they're not going to stay long, <laughs> which is so sad. But that's kind of how the Knicks are in operation is like, oh, wow, this guy's really good. He's going to get shipped out. <laughs> and, and I mean, with all these players 
being shipped out year after year, does that make it harder from a fan's perspective also? When it, you, you turn on the TV the next season and half the team is gone, you don't even know who you're rooting so for. That's that's actually the toughest part because, like, when I was a fan, like, when I was a, a huge fan of the Knicks and was, that was, like, my basketball team that I watched because there was a phase where I really – that was, like, I cared about basketball more than football for a couple of years. So – that phase where they had the Jeremy Lin, Amari Stoudemire, J.R. Smith, they had obviously Mello. Like that, like nucleus of a team, was was a thing for a couple of years. I mean, you had like one or two people moving. You had injuries. You had stuff like that. But like, you didn't have to watch the Knicks to know who was on the team because you knew. And now it's like. Every year I like go to watch a Knicks game and I see these jerseys and I'm like, I don't know who this is and I know nothing about them. But yeah, I mean, as far as like rec- like having that win sanity, like literally that one word means so much to New Yorkers, not even Knicks fans, but just New Yorkers, because everyone remembers that stretch. And, and like, and I think that recognize like that recognition is like important to the team. Right, because it was somebody the fans could look towards and be like, that is, that's our guy, that's our team. Oh, yeah. And it's crazy to look back on, but that was eight years ago at this point. It was, uh, a, yeah. it was, it was a one-month stretch eight years ago that Knicks fans still look back on as, like, our glory years. And, yeah. I mean, that's, that's crazy to think there about. There was, I mean, it, the eight years ago, it was at that time, they were selling Lin Sanity bands in 7-Eleven. I don't know if you remember this. They had like those live strong bands. They had Lin Sanity bands everywhere. Everyone was wearing Lin Sanity bands for one player going on one hot streak. Like that's how important the Knicks are to New York that like if we get hot, everyone cares. So quickly the tide can change in the NBA because of turnover. So I, I do think from that perspective that like, that hardcore fandom is a little absurd in that extent because you're you're watching such a different product like over the course of 10 years just trace the Cleveland Cavaliers from the drafting of Kyrie Irving to LeBron coming back home to the state that they're in now it's like three different franchises over the course of a decade it's tough and I think to relate it to the Knicks you could when there's no stone when there's no pillar of franchise that you can look to as as like your Paul Pierce, your Magic Johnson for Lakers fans in the eighties, or some like just somebody that you can look to year over year as the reason why you're cheering for that team. Like you look at like the the point you made with the Cavs of how there's been three different teams basically in the last five years. It's the same thing with the Knicks when you're firing GMs and you're firing coaches and the roster is turning over year after year after year. And the only thing that's remaining consistent is the guy at the top, the owner. I think that's where you, you start to see a problem with, with modern fandom. And especially when, when it, when it relates to the player empowerment movement going on in the NBA now, where, like you said, players are moving more than ever. So if you don't have a stable organization at the top that empowers the right people, then you're just going to have a circus show that you don't even know who you're cheering for year after year. I know you're not a GM, but this whole thing has kind of been centered around the the dysfunction around the Knicks. So if, if there's something that you could do that would give you hope as a Knicks fan again, like what, what could be something that the Knicks did tomorrow that would get you excited for New York basketball? Because I think fans have been lacking the that Knicks, excitement. The Knicks need to do what every rebuilding team does. And it, or every one of two things, and I think they're starting it, and – they kind of even did it with Chris Depps. You need to get the one player. It doesn't have to be the best player. It doesn't have to be the star player. They need someone for the fans to be like, oh, all right, that's, that's the guy we're going to watch. That's the guy we care about for a little bit. Because it's, it's what New York needs. New York needs its Odell, its A-Rod. Like, that is what New York is, is the star. So you need that one guy to get behind. How do you start? I think... The best way to start, given what they have at this current moment, is their rookies need to see the floor. And by rookies, I just mean they're young guys, which of which they have a lot. They've they've acquired a, a litany of first round draft picks over the course of the years, many of which haven't turned out. Kristaps being the only one who really did turn out, and we end up 
dumping him basically in exchange for, at this point, Dennis Smith Jr. So we've got all this first-round talent. Something needs to pan out, be it an R.J. Barrett, be it an Obi Toppin. Someone has to pan out. So I, I want to see these guys find some consistency. I want to see – I do think the hiring of Tom Thibodeau is kind of the right guy to, to whip these youngins into shape. Um, so however I may feel about the prospects of these players beforehand, I am rather confident that with Thibodeau at the helm for give it two, maybe three years, I do think we'll find out pretty quickly whether or not these, these players are up to par. Um, and then from that point, you can start to build around them. So what were your thoughts on the Charles Oakley situation? Despicable. I mean, it is – Look no farther than look no farther than a, for a, a shining example of paper skinned ego run rampant. I mean, has he absolute no respect for the as you said the the lifeblood of New York sports, the the culture that was established in the '90s, the the dying grasp of excellence in New York Nick fandom, the one thing that we can hang our hat on as, 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 you know, exemplary years as, as a New York Knicks fan, it's like absolutely no respect, just to spit in the face of it because of his thin skin and his ego. Again, it's, it's a repeating theme over the course of his tenure. It's no different than the way he's gone after people who've criticized his music endeavors it's no different than how he's handled any of his critics throughout. Again, he just constantly puts himself above the culture, above the faces or of the organization, the identity of the organization. Like Knicks fans identify with Spike Lee, with Oakley, with that team of the nineties, not with James Dolan, not with, with rich entitlement. And it's not to say those other guys aren't wealthy, but I mean, they earned their keep. They earned their their stay in the hearts of Knicks fans. Dolan has earned not a thing. But yeah, I could I could wrap that up with one word: disgraceful. I mean, I mean dude, that would that that would literally be like the GM of the Bulls throwing Scottie Pippen out of a game. 100%. I mean, you're taking someone that is going to be, or was at least, your team. It's the same situation that the Rams had with Eric Dickerson. He said, I'm not going. I, they kicked him out of practices, of everything. He was the Rams. And it's the same thing with the Knicks. That would be, I mean, that would be like uh, the Heat or the Cavs kicking out LeBron for him saying, you need to get your stuff together. And when a former player, no one cares about a team more than a former player. They care about the team because that's who they represent in retirement. There's, there's not a doubt in my mind that so long as, you know, the Knicks remain under the Dolan regime, that fans can expect nothing but disappointment. In speaking to fellow New Yorkers, I believe the messaging is loud and clear. Blind loyalty will no longer be shown to an organization who's given fans 20 plus years of the opposite. The city deserves better, and it starts and ends with Dolan.